Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you on the global stage of Melting Pot, the unique venue of uh, speeches and interview. Actually, it is the biggest event of its type. It's multidisciplinary forum in the Europe. Today, we, are, uh, we have an interview of Rethinking Globalization. The interviewer is John Perkins, and our guest is Helena norberg Hoch. Thank you, Dennis. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Helena, for being here. Um, so, just a few words about myself, and I apologize if some of you have been at some of these other events, so you're going to hear me say the same thing over again, basically, but um, I was a chief economist at an international consulting firm uh, for a number of years, but my main job was to be an economic hitman, and uh, I describe that in a book, several books on confessions of an economic hitman, which have sold millions of copies in about 40 languages. But the easiest way to explain what an economic hitman does is a short cartoon that, that Peter's going to play for us. Thank you. Oh, yeah. We economic hitmen have managed to create the world's first truly global empire, and it's basically a secret empire. We do it many ways, but, but, but principally, uh, we identify a country that has resources our corporations covet, like oil, range a huge loan to that country from the World Bank or one of its sisters. The money never actually goes to the country. It goes to our own corporations to build big infrastructure projects in that country that help a few very wealthy people but don't benefit the majority of the people who are too poor to buy electricity or have cars to drive on the highways, and yet they're left holding a huge debt that they can't repay. So we go back at some point and say, you know, you can't pay your debts. Give us a pound of flesh. Sell your oil real cheap to our oil companies. Vote with us on the next critical UN vote. Allow us to build a military base in your backyard. Something along these lines. And when we fail, the jackals go in and either overthrow or assassinate these leaders. And if the jackals fail, as they did in, in, in Iraq, then they'll be sent in the military. I don't think the failure is capitalism. I think it's a specific kind of capitalism that we've developed. We've created what I consider a mutant viral form of capitalism. And this mutant form of capitalism, which I think is really a predatory form of capitalism, has created an extremely unstable, unsustainable, unjust, and, and very, very dangerous world. Uh, I've met a lot of terrorists. I've interviewed them for books. I've never met one who wanted to be a terrorist. They're desperate people. If we want to get rid of terrorism, we must get rid of the root causes, that cancer that is destroying uh, our whole system. Because I think it's really important that we understand today we cannot have homeland security unless we understand that the whole planet is our homeland. So, I mean, I like to say it's, it's, it's very humbling to have spent a number of years writing a book that's over 200 pages long that just gets summarized in two minutes very, very adequately. <laughs> and I had nothing to do with that cartoon. It just appeared on the, uh, uh, it's my voice, but I never gave permission. Uh, but I never, they've ever not, I never asked permission to show it either, so I guess there's a fair trade-off there. <laughs> but in any case, uh, what that, that uh, video, what that cartoon showed was what we call the economic hitman strategy. And this is a strategy that's really uh, created what we call a, a death economy, an economic system that's uh, driven by the goal of maximizing short-term profits and consumerism, uh, regardless of the social and environmental costs. And it's an economic system that is polluting and consuming itself into self-destruction. Uh, it's depleting the very resources in the short term that it needs for the long term. It just cannot continue. The alternative is what we refer to as a life economy, an economic system that 
is based on the goal of long maximization of long-term benefits for all life. And the recognition that businesses have to make short-term profits to keep going, but they don't have to maximize those profits. Uh, they, can, they can put some of it toward creating a better world. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> for example, paying people and, and creating businesses that pay people to clean up pollution, to uh, mine all the plastic that's floating around in the oceans, to regenerate destroyed environments, to replant forests that have been destroyed, <clears throat> rejuvenate coral reefs, to pay people to, to recycle, and to come up with new technologies and processes that don't ravage the earth, that enhance life, you know, solar, wind, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of these things already, but to do more of them. And, you know, I'm very struck by this place where we are all sitting right now. This room, this complex, is such a model of what can be done to transform the death economy to a life economy. So, as most of you probably know, this was a huge <clears throat> steel mill complex. It was called the, the, the steel heart of the Soviet Union and built on a coal mine. And in the 1990s, the coal mine basically lost, ended up uh, devastated of coal. So there was no more coal. And <clears throat> it had consumed itself <laughs> into extinction. And the steel mill had to shut down. And it was a huge problem for this whole area. The employment, all the, all the conditions here. The, the one thing, it, the one benefit was that pollution was reduced a lot. But basically, this, this death economy had destroyed itself. And, but rather than giving up, the people here and people of the Czech Republic decided to create something that is very much a part of the life economy, what we have today, that honors the arts, that honors the literature, that, that honors us standing here, sitting here discussing these things, that honors music. And so this is very much a great example of making that transformation. I, I, I love it. I, I, I've been, this is my third year here, and I remember the first year we came here just being so deeply impressed by this site. Uh, and so in that context, I, I want to introduce uh, Helena. Um, and you know, I, I, in a world that's so filled with inequality, with environmental destruction, erosion of, of, cultural, culture, of, of cultural traditions, of local cultures, of local communities, a world that's, a, that's just forgotten about so many of these values, Helena stands out as a beacon of hope and, uh, and the embodiment of resilience, someone who has really moved us forward and helped us to understand the interconnectedness of, of our global crises and shed light on the destructive consequences of the system that we've created that values profit among all other things. And some facts about Helena is she's a linguist, an author, a filmmaker, and a pioneer of the new economy movement. She is the founder and director of Local Futures and the conveyor of World Localization Day. She is author of the inspirational classic, Ancient Futures, which I went to Ladakh many years ago, and this was my guiding book. It was a magnificent book. And, and more recently, uh, Local is Our Future and producer of the award-winning documentaries, The Econ Economics of Happiness <laughs> Good. and of Planet Local. She is the founder of the International Alliance for Localization and a co-founder of the International Forum on Globalization and the Global Echo Village Network. She is also the recipient of the Alternative Nobel Prize, the uh, Arthur Morgan Award, and the Goa Peace Prize for contributing to, quote, the revitalization of cultural and biological diversity and the strengthening of local communities and economies worldwide. I think above all else, you know, if you're, Helena is committed uh, to looking at new ways uh, to approach life on this planet as human beings. And with that, I turn it over to you, Helena. <laughs> Thank you. Very honored to be here with you and in complete agreement about the death economy and the need to build life 
economies, I would say plural. So that's a slight tweak on what John is saying, is that <clears throat> my experiences in many different cultures has made me absolutely convinced that we need to decentralize from this global empire that John or that other person in that cartoon displayed, beautiful job that was showing how interlinked corporations and banks in effect constitute a global empire. My experience that led me to look at this creation of this empire and to question it was from Ladakh or Little Tibet. It's the westernmost part of Tibet where I arrived in the mid-70s, since 1975. I was a linguist. I had learned a lot of European languages and I'd been asked to go out as part of a film team to this unknown part of the world, a part of Tibet that belonged politically to India. It had been sealed off for political reasons, so no one had been allowed to go there. So it was an amazing opportunity to get to know a culture that had not been colonized, that had not even been shaped by Christian missionaries. And this is partly why I'm so committed to respect for diversity, for cultural diversity linked to the diversity of life, to the life economy. I was only planning to be there for six weeks to learn a bit of the language, to help make a documentary, but I fell in love with the most amazing, vital, energetic, and joyful people sense of humor. I have to say that I met the Dalai Lama many times, and most people in Ladakh were Dalai Lamas. They had that lightness and that sparkle, and so I fell in love. I ended up staying when the film was finished, and from that, speaking the language fluently, I had a very rare opportunity to go back in time. I mean, in, a, in many ways, I was going back a few hundred years, in other places, 500 years. And later on, I wrote a book when I had been there over 16 years, and usually for about half of every year, I wrote a book called Ancient Futures, and we made a film later by the same title, between the book and the film, they were translated into more than, 40, more than 45 languages. We've lost track of some of them, included Czech, both, I think, for the film and the book. And from all around the world, I kept getting this message, the story you tell of Ladakh is our story too. And I got a lot of yeah, appreciation and that's what keeps me going today, is that I'm in touch with grassroots groups around the world who are also really convinced that small scale, human scale, more localized economies are necessary for our well-being. So I want to say something about my insights into the social, psychological side of this. And basically, what I found was that in more traditional ways of living, before big business changed our way of life, we lived in bigger families and with a bigger community network. Every mother had about 10 caretakers for every child. And the amazing thing about it was that the friendship, the love, the support between the one-year-old and the 90-year-old was a marriage made in heaven, a much happier marriage than most of our nuclear marriages. Remember, at that age, under one and 90, we are hairless, toothless, we can't walk very well. We are mates, and this is how we evolved. We evolved with that deep connection, and it was economic in the sense that it was totally 
relieving the parents to be active in a different type of economic activity, whereas now these supports for the old and the young have been turned into institutions are pretty dead. They're part of the death economy. The life economy is an economy of reconnection. It's a path of reconnection to life. And that life includes other human beings. That life includes other generations. We were segregated into monocultures as part of an industrial, corporate wealth accumulation. So I think in order to really understand how it is that we've allowed this empire of global corporations to run the world, we need to go deep to the beginnings of the economy. And what we'll see is that slave traders and a group of men from Europe started transforming economic activity around the world, pushing people away from producing a range of things for their own needs to produce for European traders. So we grew up learning about, oh, this is a tin country, and this is a tea region, and this is coffee. We didn't realize that we were learning to read the map of the world according to corporate exploitation. We didn't think about the fact that removing people's rights to focus on producing for their needs was actually rather destructive. So the slave owners actually also were happy to commit genocide. They were linked to a shift in worldview, which was also misogynist, overtly misogynist. Earlier, the rise to this global expansion had been helped by Christian development, where women were burnt at the stake for their deep ecological, spiritual knowledge of the diversity of nature. They were in human scale ways of living, and they were known to have a wisdom and power in terms of their knowledge of nature. So this build up taking us away from more decentralized or localized ways of living where we produce for our own needs and where women had a very strong position it was shifted starting with Christianity, later on with slavery, genocide, and enclosures. So in Britain, we need to look at what happened when people were forced away from the land into Dickensian London. You had a mess, you had crime, you had illness, you had just a breakdown as people were suddenly crowded together to produce for the wealthy traders who were among other things bringing cheap cotton from India to have now cheap labor manufacture under industrial conditions. So children were herded into a type of schooling, which was also monocultural, segregated into separate age groups, and their training became more and more monolithic. You are, you know, you are an engineer who does this, or you are this. So we became defined by this one function. In the cultures of life, in the economies of life that predate this exploitation, in those, in those diverse cultures, people had multiple skills. <clears throat> and they were never segregated into age group monocultures. They were not reduced down to a little nuclear family. The nuclear family, by the way, um, creates this very difficult bipolar structure where the intense dependence is so strong that it's very hard to keep a balance that both parties need the other in the same way. So I discovered how wonderful it is when you're held in more of a basket of relationships and, and none of them exert so much pressure on any one person. Anyway, for us today to learn from those traditional uh, cultures of life 
we, of course, realized that we're not going to go back to the extended family. We're not going to go back to living exactly as indigenous people did. But I really believe that we should have clarity about the structural path that has allowed this creation of this empire. I believe that almost nobody is completely aware of how they are contributing to that empire. And we are all, as John also said earlier, in many ways, we are the aliens. We uh, might not have heard that, but he was talking about the aliens that support this empire. In many ways, you and I have contributed to it. In many ways, of course, the CEOs of the big corporations are contributing even more. Our governments are actually rolling out the red carpet for global business today. And I think this is something that we should be talking more about, John, that the trade treaties that were brought in after the Second World War were essentially a red carpet for global business. And this red carpet for global business was set up at the same time as the IMF and the World Bank. And it was the GATT, which was the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade. This general agreement on tariffs and trade was about integrating so-called all economic activity in the world. And the belief was, if we want to avoid another world war, if we want to avoid another depression, we need to do this. But people were not clearly looking at the fact that this integration took place by governments being pressured to open their economies to giant monopolies. So already from the time of the Second World War, this path of concentrating wealth in the hands of fewer and fewer banks and corporations has been going on. In the 80s, in the late 80s, it took on the name of globalization. But it's preceded by this process that went unnoticed. I'm from Sweden, and I had lived in Ladakh and had seen how incredibly happy people were. I had experienced also that they were much healthier. And by the way, in terms of happiness, they could not understand the word depression. They just couldn't understand it. And when I tried to explain, you know, in the West, people feeling unhappy, there are special doctors for them called psychologists absolutely could not understand this. When I went back to Sweden, when I'd been out there for a few years, I was so much more aware of the unhappiness, that the death economy is an economy of unhappiness. And I realized that progress, and remember, probably in the Czech Republic, and even today in America and many places, people think of Scandinavia as a sort of perfect model you know, between communism and capitalism, this socialist model was really good. I can tell you in fundamental ways, no. Fundamentally, what had happened in Sweden was the same as these other top-down isms, big scale, bureaucratic, top-down structures, squashing genuine individualism, destroying the community fabric, and very importantly, destroying rural communities, smaller towns, smaller cities, continually subsidizing an urbanization and an industrialization, use of, using lots of energy, mainly fossil fuels. But today, beware, and I wish I had a chance to talk to Bill. I've known Bill McKibben since the 70s, and I do not think the climate framing is telling us what we need to hear about why emissions continue to increase. Now, also in the name of a Green New Deal and renewable energy, because we're this path using lots of energy, which destroys the small and especially the more rural not just villages, but even small cities that are still related to the land around. 
a balance between urban and rural is systematically being destroyed. So I saw in Sweden, even in the 70s, that the majority of people were now living in high-rise centers in the city. And in Stockholm, half of all the dwellings, houses and apartments, one person living alone it was so clear how this was connected to the economics of unhappiness. I even, as I spoke to psychiatrists and more and more people, they became aware that even having a goldfish, something alive in a little bowl of water, could make you happier. But in many places, there was no connection to life. There was no connection to other people. There was very little connection to nature, if any, you know. So the path of the economy of life is linked to an economics that rebuilds a balance between rural and urban. Our work in my organization has ended up over now, it's almost 50 years, you know, just like John, um, that what I've seen is that food and farming is a central lever that we should be focusing on to start right now, wherever you are, supporting the economics of life. What we have found is that small, diversified farms can increase productivity. Just remember this, you take any plots of land and you plant only cotton or only apples, you will never be able to produce as much as you can if you diversify. And we're not talking about regenerative agriculture which focuses on diversity in the soil. Diversity in the soil is fundamental. The microbiome, our gut biome completely connected, but we want diversity above ground. How do we get that? We need smaller markets. We need markets closer to the farm. So when you think of local food, don't just think of how the food is produced. Think about the whole system from the seed to the table. Help to put at the center an economic activity which is the only thing that we produce that everybody needs every day. Please raise awareness about the fact that right now, the economics of death is completely linked to global trade, supporting global traders, and that our governments are encouraging food in huge monocultures for export. And this goes back to the beginnings of the modern economy. Production on larger and larger scale monoculture for trade makes the traders rich, the global traders rich, and everybody else poorer. Right now, America exports about 3.5 billion tons of beef and turns around and imports about 3.5 billion tons of beef. The UK exports as much butter and milk as it imports. Ending the import and export of identical products overnight could reduce climate emissions systemically. And where would the harm be? Who would be hurt? Profits of global corporations, which would translate into profits for multiple winners, multiple players, farmers, businesses, co-ops. We don't hear about that when we talk about climate. And we don't hear that not only is food being imported and exported across the world, but food is being sent to China to be processed. They send fish from Norway, from England, from America, from Australia to China to be deboned and sent back again. Apples are flown to be washed in South Africa, flown back again to England. This insanity, which could be ended relatively easily if we wake up, if we wake up and focus on the systemic and structural problems, uh, there is an enormous potential to translate our clear desires for a healthier relationship to others, 
to nature, a clear desire to try to do something about the environment. People are demonstrating that in a multitude of ways. But we're trapped in a paradigm, we're trapped in a, in a view of the world that points the finger at us as individuals. What we, by the way, how much time have I have been blabbering on? 30 more minutes, really? Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I could go on forever because I'd love to tell you more about traditional Ladakhi life. I would love to tell you more about so many things. Um, because... Keep talking. Okay, keep, thank keep you. Keep talking. <laughs> thank you. We're loving it. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, I, the, the, maybe, maybe I'll just say now that we try to encourage people to come away with five words, a little bit like um, uh, John's, uh, was it five questions? Yeah. So we, we so agree with your questions, because again, for us, central is what makes us happy, which was your number one point. You know, think about what makes you happy, and then think about what can you do to create or build the economics of life. So we exactly say that. We are offering you a platform of material that can support a view to help you do exactly that. Help to really think about what makes you happy and to find a path that can contribute to that while supporting the life economy, which we also call the economics of happiness. And we like to leave people with five words as part of that journey. And the first word is reconnect. Now, reconnect is based on what I said earlier, the awareness which is growing worldwide that we need to be connected to others and to nature. There is more and more evidence. First of all, the 12-step program that helps people get over the worst addictions, sex addiction, drug, violence addiction. What is so effective about the 12-step program is that it brings people together to share a journey together. Also now, there is every day more evidence that people who are depressed, who have suffered trauma, are healed through connection to nature, to life. That reconnection to life is a reawakening of our spiritual inner life, which we all have a light inside that can get pretty easily sparked again, energized again when we reconnect to nature. What we have discovered is that on this journey of reconnection, when people reconnect in community, reconnect to nature, and when they add to that, engaging in practical, meaningful, productive work, like reconnecting over soil and seed saving and actually growing food, something that everybody needs and loves. All throughout our cultures, we've celebrated with food. So one of my favorite projects, which shows this so beautifully, is one that works with prisoners in England. Small, human-scale project that helps prisoners, before they're due to come out of prison, they are able to go over a year, helped to talk in community, in circle. And those prisoners will say, never in their lifetime before had they had conversations that were about connection. They'd never been talking to people in a way that was about interest. And who are you really? What are your problems? Where are you vulnerable? Are you really human or are you perfect? We've been trained to compete and to look as though we're perfect. So the art of connection is to cultivate the art of deeper dialogue and deeper listening. Then these prisoners are learning how to do this work of growing food in community. And it is transforming people, honestly. Not 100%, but pro I mean, the recidivism rate or the return to prison rate when people have been through that program, is a fraction of the regular one. Why is this not happening in every country? 
Why are we not doing the important work of caring for ourselves, caring for the land in ways that can be so meaningful? It's blindness. We don't see how we end up promoting an institutional, competitive, larger scale, fear-based path. So the number one word is reconnection. But the second word is rethinking. We urge people to come together in groups between two and maximum 30 people, meet on a regular basis, and together rethink. Think now, what can we do rather than what can I do? And then we urge people not to be afraid of resistance, to resist as well as to renew. We need to understand the economics of death, and we need to resist it. And we have to be careful that in unknown ways we don't support it because we haven't had the big picture. So the rethinking provides the bigger picture so we are clear about resisting the path of death and genuinely supporting the path of life. And that's the renewal. And the final word out of these five is rejoice. Because once you open your eyes to the fact you want to support life in all its thriving, once you connect more consciously to life, you will see how much there is to rejoice, how much there is to celebrate. So that's not to say that we are also not now very pressured for time. So a lot of people will say to me, well, we don't have time to do this. We think that this journey of you know, reconnecting, rethinking, resisting, renewing, and rejoicing can actually lead to very creative, very meaningful action that creates initiatives, projects and initiatives that exist in the hands of hundreds of millions of people around the world. Part of those hundreds of millions of people who are still living in a less industrialized, less globalized, less corporatized, less technologized, less speedy, less competitive, less alienated way of life. So in the rural parts of the world, you are more likely to find ways of doing things that work better for people and nature. But of course, Many of them are suffering, they're not perfect, but if we could understand that we need to support that way rather than blindly contributing to an urbanization. So, and the urbanization is now linked completely to corporatization. So there's a, a, a picture that can be extremely helpful and for me, the most helpful thing of all is that having seen how much is happening at the local level, having seen how many small projects, like the PRISM project I mentioned, are not only there already, but every single day there is more. I get news every single day of things that amaze me. There is so much more happening than we realize. And it all testifies to human nature's longing for connection to life, human nature's need for that. By the way, most of these initiatives are led by women. They are often not the spokespeople, but they are usually the initiators. And they include everything from Let's do schooling differently. We don't like this monoculture that's so deadening. We want to bring in community. We want to bring in nature. Everywhere you look, you will find attempts to alternative schooling. You will find in the local food movement an absolutely amazing testimony to what can be done when a few people work together. So when we change the I to a we and we look at the economy, which means it's not just how I'm gonna shop differently, but I'm interested in creating another system. The foundations of the healthy system is the more localized structure. So uh, there are, yeah, I, as I say, every day more. We are on the precipice now, I feel, 
between a big push towards the death economy by pushing us into AI and 5G, speeding up technology, which we may think is going to help us, but there are now calls for a moratorium to examine where it should be regulated, where it should be used for banking and global business, and where not. We need a path of re-regulation of global business. The deregulation through trade treaties is the globalizing path. The deregulation that started after the Second World War was accompanied by our governments subsidizing global business, subsidizing advertising abroad even. They were making global business richer and richer. And as John is saying, it wasn't actually making our countries richer. It was making global business richer. So we have virtually every government in the world rolling out the red carpet for global business, subsidizing the infrastructure for them. And that includes the way high technology is used now. So we need to be really clear about that and not say, let's not have technology, but we need to be looking at who it serves and how we can shift it to genuinely serve humanity and the economies of life. But we have this tragic thing where governments are not only subsidizing global business and removing all the rules, no rules for global business. They have clauses in the trade treaties where they say, we will not do anything that might reduce your profit. If we do, you can sue us. So Germany was sued after deciding to move away from nuclear power after Fukushima by a Swedish company called Vattenfall for 3.5 billion. Right now, the country of Honduras is being threatened by a big private corporation that wants to build big private cities in Honduras. And the democratically elected government said, no, we don't want you coming in and building cities here. Remember, the path of the economy of life is urbanizing. And they're now being sued for more than their annual GDP. I think it's 11 billion. Now, this is going on without most people knowing about it. And at the same time, our governments are over-regulating local. Deregulating global, over-regulating local. Subsidizing global, taxing local. You and I, every government enterprise, every nonprofit, individuals, businesses that are place-based or localized, even local is not just village, it's regional, it's national. Any national industry is subject to scrutiny and bureaucratic regulation. This creates an insane, unjust playing field. Shifting taxes, subsidies, and regulations overnight could transform what's going on. It could move us in the direction of the life economy. So. I, I'm going to stop there and hope that there are some comments or questions and uh, hope to stay in touch with many of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, I normally am so bad at promoting our work, but this little book is in Czech. So this, uh, tomorrow I'll also be giving a talk at 2 o'clock about localization instead of globalization. Thank you, Helena. And uh, I, as you were talking about, I was reminded how I joined the Peace Corps in 1968, uh, and the United States Peace Corps sent me deep into the Amazon rainforest to hang out with the Shwa, an indigenous culture. Before I went, I looked up the statistics from the World Bank and learned that where I was going was the most, one of the most impoverished people in the world, the Shwa. And when I got there, I found an incredibly prosperous community. They had all the food they wanted. They had great, healthy food. They hung out with their kids, and the families were all together. People worked on average two hours a day. The men went hunting for a couple hours. The women tended the gardens for a couple hours. 
then they had a good time. They played with their kids. They had a lot of sex. Uh, they, swam in the, they swam in the rivers. And what I came to understand is, you know, the World Bank said they were impoverished because they had no currency. They had no money as we know it, but they had everything they needed, including they didn't need goldfishes and bowls because they were, they, the community, they had all these little animals around. If, if anybody ever found a, you know, a lost young jaguar, they came and lived with the community. It kind of ran free. They didn't put it in a cage. It ran free. So. I, I think it's just amazing what we could do if we went back to that baseline in our understanding and then looked at what we could do on a crowded planet where we have an overabundant renewable energy source, which is human beings. But right now, the taxes, subsidies, and regulations support using energy, technology, and limited resources at every turn, replacing people. And that's what AI will do in a massive way. We don't want to do that across the board, and we don't want to do it in, at the behest of a global empire. So I just actually want to add one more thing in that part of the really important education right now is to be clear that the majority of humanity is getting poorer, but I mean massively poorer. We are giving false statistics. We're told that food is cheaper than it ever was. It's not true. It's the proportion of disposable income because housing is shooting up. We're spending relatively less on food, but we need to be talking not about the money. We need to be talking about how many hours are we working a day to put food on the table and a house roof over our heads. We are working harder and harder, faster and faster, and the time pressures are killing us. And Again, the life economy is about slowing down, scaling down, learning that if we actually allowed human beings to be liberated to do what we really need to do. And remember, the two most important functions are how we rear our children from birth to education, how we rear our food. Both of those activities have been turned into shadow work, you know, stamped upon and made, yeah, impossible to do properly. So shifting that around, we have the most amazing potential, but we don't know that because we've been trained to believe that all this scarcity and all the pollution is because there are too many people. No, it's because there are a few corporations using too many resources and not allowing us to be creative, to be truly entrepreneurial. So anyway, yeah. <laughs> Thanks. There was a hand up there in the back, I yeah, saw. Yeah, we have time for a few questions. There's, somebody, there's a hand up here also. There's a hand up back there. Thank, uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I was quite surprised by your opinion on um, urbanization because from other presentations from previous years of this festival, I learned that, for example, if people are too dispersed on rural area, it, uh, they live on a, a higher amount of, of land. There's a concept of smart cities that if we live in a cleverly built cities, we don't need to ride with cars that far. I personally live in a city where there's a car sharing, and if I lived like somewhere in the village, I would burn uh, much more fuel. So I would wonder, I wonder, why do you think urbanization is such a bad idea? Thanks. I, I think this is actually such an important issue because essentially what I'm seeing is that in academia and in science, um, particularly since the second wave of globalization from the 80s on, the funding for research has been in the hands of big business, not in a narrow, um, corrupt, conspiratorial way, but in a broad, systemic way. What happened was that in the 60s, there was a wake up in the West where people said, wait a minute, this industrial fossil fuel urbanizing path is not good. We need decentralization. There were economists like Schumacher who wrote a book called Small is Beautiful. And many of my colleagues 
we were all very clear we needed decentralization and that we needed more holistic, interdisciplinary science. Rachel Carson, a woman scientist, alerted the world to the fact that we think it's fine to create DDT and kill some nasty worms over here, but actually it's killing birds over there. We can't do this, we need to wake up. And there was a sincere attempt uh, so that governments actually responded to this and in many universities we had interdisciplinary departments and I taught in some of them, I was connected to a few in different countries, but I saw that this shift towards big business taking over happened with things like biology and now suddenly became genetic engineering. That was what was funded and that was what more and more of the research went into. And I'm afraid that with an issue like urban-rural, there were studies that compared high-density living, where you didn't use your car, you just walked, with suburbanized living, where you did drive your car, and you had centralized the infrastructure, and then the suburbanized was more energy-intensive. It was not contrasting the genuinely decentralized the smaller town that was related to food and farming from the region, the, the, the small town where you also didn't drive a lot because you had the walking paths and the bicycle paths and, and you even had the privilege, as I did, especially in Ladakh, but I've lived in other places in England and Australia, small towns where I can literally walk into nature in a relatively short period. So the the idea that urbanization lowers our footprint is a corporate big business idea. So please, please look beyond the dominant studies. Actually, I'd like to give you another example because having promoted local food economies now for 30 some years and helped to start farmers markets and various, especially farmers markets are wonderful, but there are many other ways of linking the farmers and consumers. We started getting studies that started saying, oh, no, no, this is not really good for emissions. Like uh, very early on, there was a study in England that said, oh, no, don't believe that local food economies are going to lower greenhouse emissions. It's better in England if you buy the lamb from New Zealand than from U UK because in UK, they use brown energy, and in New Zealand, they use green energy. Now, did that study contrast those really nice smaller farms in England that were selling lamb locally or regionally? No. They were looking at big monocultures for export, and the idea that all the energy in England was brown and all green in New Zealand was wrong anyway. Recently, as the local food movement keeps growing, because it is, because it works, and I can tell you if you want to do something that you're going to see grow and flourish, I would urge you to focus on local food because things like local currencies generally don't work so well. There are, well, I'll talk about more tomorrow about various localization initiatives, but I just want to say that more recently, again, there are these studies that basically say emissions are not really reduced through localized food systems, and they don't mention the fact that the emissions from global trade are nowhere mentioned, because in the climate negotiations, you are not allowed to talk about global trade. So nobody's mentioning the emissions from global trade. It's unbelievable. I don't know, where is Bill? I want to shout it at him. Why is he not mentioning it? Because he sort of knows it. So in all these climate negotiations, a close colleague of ours has been at all of them. She's seen it's big business that came up with the carbon agenda and that is part of a system where no one is calculating all these emissions from trade. We need to understand that when we come up with statistics that tell us the carbon footprint of the Czech Republic is X. The US footprint is X. It's a complete idiocy. It's a lie. No one is mentioning that what you're using is produced in China. Doesn't that include your carbon footprint? 
It certainly does, and especially when factories have gone over to China to produce there in a dirty, polluting way, and then transport things back to us. But that doesn't go into the accounting. So we're having a blindness and an idiocy that's going on now that we really must wake up to, because it makes us feel guilty, it points the finger at the individual, um, and in a way which I hope Greg Pallast, who's coming, he's speaking next. Oh, good. Greg, I hope he, we were talking about that this morning and he was agreeing how, how false it is. So we have this situation that makes us feel disempowered, makes us feel guilty, while the way of solving this frightening issue, as I said, systemically, could be dealt with relatively rapidly and on a massive scale. If we stop importing and exporting the same product, if we start producing more of our needs in our own countries, we are talking about a massive systemic shift. But right now, if we simply stop exporting all that beef out of the United States and beef from elsewhere into the United States, if we stop Right now, UK and Australia exchange bottled water, import and export bottled water, which is not nearly as frightening as the fact that our daily needs, you know, our milk, our butter, our vegetables are being transported across the world, that there's no mention of these emissions, not allowed or even mentioned in the climate negotiations. Instead, the finger is pointed at you, and how do you dare drive your car, and you're not doing the right thing. And worst of all, the dominant narrative is humanity is flawed. We are all greedy, aggressive, and horrible by nature. That's the most dangerous and frightening part of this false narrative. My argument is not that all those people in the global banks and corporations are nasty and evil by nature. My argument is that we have all blindly contributed to assumptions that have built up this empire that is so destructive and that is the economics of death. And right now there is this opportunity to really open our eyes and support and help build on the economics of life. But while we do that, while we remember, you know, reconnect and, and also rethink, resist, renew and rejoice, while we do that at the local level, please join big picture activism to spell out the fact that if we stopped subsidizing and regulating to support global monopolies and we shifted taxes, subsidies and regulations to support genuine creative entrepreneurship adapted to diversity, biological diversity, the realities of life. It's amazing what we could do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I'm afraid we've, we've run out of time, but that was a very good closing. I think that brought us here, so. Thank you again, and th thanks all of you for being here. And, and uh, I, I see that uh, uh, Greg Pallas just arrived in the hall, so he'll be speaking next. Hi, Greg. You better put your hat on so people can recognize you. <laughs> Thank you. Another, another round of applause for Helena. Beautiful, beautiful speech.